Unsolved mysteries have always intrigued people because they represent the unknown and the unexplained, which can be both fascinating and unsettling. Humans are naturally curious creatures, and we are always looking for answers to the questions that intrigue us. Soldiers share their mysterious encounters. Soldiers deserve the highest respect. Opinions aside, they go into areas where many of us will never tread, and they are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. Something that many soldiers don't expect to happen is having mysterious encounters while on duty. In recent years, military personnel have come forward and detailed some of the strange things that they've experienced while on duty. One soldier titled their post as Strange Encounter While on Duty. They said the following. I was a young sergeant in 2001, and I was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base. I would often guard equipment, and it's known that the area is highly sensitive. Most of the time I would be on guard, and nothing interesting would happen. There were many times that I would be bored, and the job would be repetitive, but that all changed when I had a mysterious encounter. At the time, there were two of us who were on patrol, and it was my partner who first noticed something strange. In the distance, he claimed he could see a red light, and that every so often it would pulsate. We were located near the outskirts of the base, and so thought that it may have been an aircraft in the distance. Around ten minutes later, both of us witnessed the bright light descending nearby. The two of us hadn't seen these lights before, so naturally we were both suspicious of what this was. We couldn't make out any insignia or any propulsion system. The aircraft would rise again to around 100 feet in the air, and once the object was within our sight again, we got a much better look. It was like a huge ball of energy, and was as if someone had shrunk the sun. As the encounter continued, we started to notice a pattern. The object would fly around the base, descend, and then fly into the air again, and it kept doing this over and over. While it was doing this repetitive motion, it was making no sound, and it was hard for us to keep track of it, because once it descended, we would lose sight of it. After this, the object darted towards us, and must have stopped within 40 feet, at which point we were able to see some closer details. This thing was a perfect sphere, and moved around at extreme speeds, but the strangest thing was that it moved in an angular way, like if you were playing an old computer game and you had drawn out lines and then the object would follow those lines. It's hard to describe, but the movement wasn't fluid. It wasn't like a plane that has to turn slowly in order to maneuver, or a balloon that gets taken by the wind. Every time this object moved, it was always at an angle. Although the movements of this thing were jarring, the speeds it was hitting were incredible, and if you blinked, it would be in a completely different place. It was like the light would turn off and then reappear in another part of the sky. After around ten minutes, the object just vanished, and we were no longer able to see it. It made me think that if my partner had not pointed out the strange light in the first place, then it's likely that I wouldn't have noticed it, especially because it made no noise. Our chief sergeant pulled me in for a conversation after catching wind of what we had encountered, and honestly, it didn't go the way I thought it would. I was thinking that I would be put down and told that I didn't see anything. But instead, those who were in the room seemed interested in the sighting. When I asked what this thing was and whether anyone else had seen it, I got very little back, but was told at the end that it would be best if I kept this to myself. Although nothing super eventful happened, I never got closure on what the object was, and still to this day think about how that strange light was able to hit the speed it did. End quote. Interestingly, there have been many reported sightings of a massive legendary creature that's been described as looking like a large humanoid. They are mostly sighted in remote areas, sometimes in urban areas, and very rarely in city parks. However, the most unlikely place you would think to see one of these creatures is near a military base. Throughout the years there have been a few reports that have leaked from military installations, mostly those around the 1970s. By far the most notable and the most credible is that of an encounter near Fort Lewis in the United States. This is an army military installation in Washington state, which is in the middle of a rather large wooded area. The year was 1978. A truck full of soldiers coming back from training exercises broke down at around 8 in the evening. Attempts were made to restart the engine, but nothing worked, so the platoon headed off to the base on foot to bring back a tow truck. They left one Edwin Godoy to guard the truck until the tow truck arrived. 
He was left because he was the one who had signed out the truck. Edwin spent hours by himself just sitting in the truck. He was bored, but his evening would soon perk up. At around midnight, he began to hear strange sounds from the forest that this road cut through. The sounds continued to get louder and closer, prompting Edwin to get out of the truck, arming himself with a rifle and a flashlight. As he stood in front of the truck, sweeping the sides of the woods with his flashlight, he caught a glimpse of a large object moving directly in front of the truck. It was a tall, broad creature entirely covered in hair that walked by swinging its body sideways. When Irvin shined his light at it, it stopped in its tracks and stared directly at him. They locked eyes for a short time before the creature began to run at him at a bafflingly quick speed. Irvin shouted three times for the creature to stop and identify itself. However, the beast didn't reply and got close enough to cause harm to Edwin. Gripped with fear, he shot the creature in the chest. This barely stopped the speed of the animal. It merely growled, grabbed its chest and turned to the right and went back into the forest. In a few seconds, it was gone. After a long and fearful night, the mechanics finally arrived. After Edwin conveyed what happened, they were quite sceptical, until one spotted the blood trail that led to massive footprints pressed into the nearby soft ground. Shortly after, a radio call was made to the base explaining what had happened, and after doing this, the area was swamped with secretive government scientists in hazardous material suits. These researchers then began taking blood samples and setting casts of the footprints. The whole time Edwin was told not to speak to anyone and was kept away from what was going on. Edwin was quickly taken away to the base hospital, but surprisingly, instead of being examined by the base's medical staff, he was examined by a doctor from the Air Force that held the rank of full colonel. Years later, Edwin went on to reveal in an interview after the event had been declassified that rather than interrogating him, the colonel was very interested in every slight detail of the event. After which, Edwin was returned to his barracks and told in no circumstances was he to tell anyone what happened. The NASA employee who went missing in the Grand Canyon Back on the 17th of June 2016, a man by the name of Floyd Roberts III had gone on a hiking trip with a longtime friend of his, Ned Bryant, and his friend's daughter, Madeline Bryant. However, after several hours of hiking together, Floyd suddenly disappeared from the group. As the weeks went on and the investigation into the matter was never resolved, many began to wonder what exactly happened to Floyd Roberts within the very short span of time that he had wandered away from his group. According to Ned Bryant, he and Floyd had been lifelong friends since they were ten years old, when they first met each other back in Princeton, New Jersey. Their friendship was so close that many would often think that Ned and Floyd were actually brothers, their friendship would even coalesce and maintain throughout their entire lives, with Floyd Roberts serving as Ned's best man during his wedding several years prior. Unfortunately, due to work requirements and job opportunities, the two men were unable to live close to each other, with Floyd Roberts eventually moving out to the city of Huntsville, Alabama, where he spent a short period of time working as a software engineer for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. After a short time of working for NASA, Floyd Roberts moved once more to work as a computer programming and game design teacher at Middleton High School, located in Treasure Island, Florida. However, throughout this time, Floyd and Ned decided to stay close friends and would meet up regularly to do an activity together. It was back in 1992 when Floyd and Ned decided that they would start hiking around the Grand Canyon a few times a year, as it would be a fun activity for them to both do that would also allow them to take a break from their lives momentarily and get some much-needed exercise. These routine hiking trips would continue for over the next 20 years together, where the two men became highly experienced campers and hikers, familiar with the Grand Canyon as it was their only hiking route. Even more interesting, the two men were so interested in hiking that they would often travel alone in their free time whenever the other was unable to join, showing that both men had experience navigating the known pathways of the area, even when isolated and on their own. Several years later, Ned Bryant and a few other members of his family became board members of the Grand Canyon Hikers and Backpackers Association, often sharing tips with each other on the best pathways and means of travel throughout the area, and having been trained in travel safety when hiking through isolated parts of the Grand Canyon. Confident that the two would be perfectly safe during their journey, the men planned to take one of their longest hiking and camping trips yet, 
choosing to spend nine days hiking through the Shivwitz Plateau, a pathway that would lead them out of the area through the Separation Canyon. Although the region was a typically less popular area to travel through, their decided route was considered to have been largely very safe, without any major pitfalls or ravines close to their trails. Additionally, the two men decided that the beginning of the journey would be the most relaxed and planned on spending the first couple of days camping alongside the major river in the area before making their way out of the canyon. After careful consideration, the two men planned their trip and decided that their hike would end after nine days on the 26th of June, 2016. At the last minute, Ned's daughter, Madeline Bryant, decided to join the group, and so the group decided that the easiest path down towards the river they had wanted to camp beside for a few days was to first reach the Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument when entering from the furthest western portion of the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument is considered to be a remote location and terribly underdeveloped given the lack of tourists that tend to visit the area. According to official park services, there are no known paved roads or laid out trails leading to the National Monument and no visitor services of any kind. Regardless, the group decided the open area and the lack of tourists would be a perfect staging ground to enter towards the river without the stress of strangers crowding around the area. Once the group was several miles away from the main trailhead of the area, the three travellers found themselves travelling over a large hill. Given Floyd Roberts' preference for a longer travelling time to help take in the scenery, he decided that he would take the slow, rounding trail that followed the contours of the hill to reach the trailhead, whereas Madeline and Ned decided that a straight path over the hill would allow them to reach the trailhead faster and give them time to relax and take a quick rest. At around 4.45 in the afternoon, the group separated, with Ned and his daughter taking a straight-line path, and Floyd Roberts following the trail that wrapped around the side of the hill. Several minutes later, Ned and Madeline would reach the trailhead and decide to take a short rest, waiting for Floyd Roberts to catch up to them. However, after about 20 minutes of waiting, the two started to worry that something had happened and immediately began retracing their steps to look for Floyd Roberts, who they assumed must have gotten lost somewhere along the contouring path. After spending several hours looking for Floyd Roberts, the two decided that it was too dark and dangerous for them to continue their search and so made a campsite near the trailhead meeting spot in the hopes that Floyd Roberts would be able to locate them by their fire. Unfortunately, the two said that it appeared as if Floyd had just completely disappeared, and so Ned and Madeline hiked their way to the nearest area with cell phone reception to report Floyd Roberts as missing. The two reported Floyd Roberts' disappearance at around 3 in the afternoon on Saturday, June 18th. Almost immediately, a team of search and rescue working for the National Park started their search for Floyd Roberts, covering a 10-mile radius of where he had last been seen by Ned Bryant and his daughter. The search and rescue originally showed up for the search efforts in high spirits, believing that Roberts would have been recovered quickly, given the fact that the weather in the area did not drop anywhere near freezing temperatures and stayed relatively high throughout the day and night. Additionally, Floyd Roberts had been carrying a week's supply of food and over two gallons of water in his backpack at the time of his disappearance, so it was believed that he would have more than enough supplies and years of experience to help him navigate his way towards help, if necessary. Over the next few days, an estimated 15 people were involved with the search and rescue of Floyd Roberts, with a team of sniffer dogs used to follow his scent. It was at around this time that a set of footprints had been discovered that followed down the direction of the trail that Ned and his daughter Madeline had claimed Floyd was last seen travelling down. As the dogs followed the trail, it appeared as if they had locked onto the scent of Roberts and continued in the direction of the footprints for several hundred feet before they suddenly stopped. Search and rescuers then noticed that the footprints of Floyd Roberts seemed to have suddenly disappeared, as if Roberts had been walking and then rose into the air and vanished. It was at this point that the National Park Service rescue helicopter was used to get aerial views of the surrounding 10-mile radius, but were unable to locate any signs of someone having fallen down any side paths or in any known areas. After six days of frantic searching and thousands of man-hours, the search and rescue for Floyd Roberts slowed down to a passive search. To this day, no sign of Roberts has been recovered. According to official search and rescue reports, Floyd Roberts was last seen wearing a red long-sleeved shirt, blue denim jeans, 
a large blue low alpine contour backpack, white rimmed sunglasses with orange lenses, and two gallons of water with enough food to last him about a week. The Disappearance of Margaret Mary Kohler On the 20th of February, back in 2011, a 53-year-old woman by the name of Margaret Kohler would suddenly vanish after planning a short daytime visit to the Cummins Creek Wilderness. Although investigators originally thought that Margaret's case was that of an inexperienced hiker travelling too deep within the National Park Forest, investigators would soon realise that Margaret Kohler would frequently travel to the Cummins Creek Wilderness to forage for wild mushrooms and truffles. According to Margaret's friend, Mrs. Kohler had become quite familiar with the region and would often take weekly trips to the area with her five-year-old Labrador border collie mix, named Roscoe. Growing up in the seaside city of Waldport, Oregon, Margaret Kohler had become highly experienced with the outdoors, Cummins Creek Wilderness, and the surrounding trails, and was known by her friends and family as having been an avid hiker. Yet regardless of her vast amount of wilderness experience and her many safety precautions, Margaret Kohler would seemingly vanish with no trace of her left behind. The search for Margaret would begin on the day of her disappearance after her friend contacted the local sheriff's department and claimed that she was unable to make contact with Mrs. Kohler at their scheduled time. Due to her frequently travelling alone, Margaret was worried that if she did not take the necessary precautions, she could end up injured and stranded out in the National Park without anyone knowing she was gone. It was for this very reason that Margaret told her friend prior to her trip that she was planning on taking Roscoe for a walk near the Cape Perpetua area. Although the last time Margaret had been seen was on the 19th of February, after getting an expected time frame of Margaret's itinerary from her friend, detectives were able to put an accurate time to when Margaret Kohler had arrived in the area, believed to have been during the early morning. Within only eight hours of her disappearance, the Lane and Lincoln County Sheriff's Department, alongside the United States Forest Service and the Oregon State Police, would begin their search and rescue efforts for Margaret and Roscoe. Oddly enough, after scouring several parking lots and common stops, the search and rescue teams were unable to locate Margaret Kohler's vehicle. Given the fact that the investigators were unsure which trail Margaret Kohler had followed, it made it increasingly difficult for search and rescue teams to efficiently check a tighter radius, forcing them to expand their search to a much larger area. Local volunteer groups had spent the better part of the first two days walking up and down the Cape Perpetua area, but were unable to find any tracks or signs of Margaret Kohler having visited anywhere in the region. With the lack of any sign of Margaret's vehicle or equipment anywhere near the region, investigators started to wonder whether or not the missing hiker was even within the park. For this reason, in conjunction with the search and rescue efforts, the local sheriff's department would keep out a missing person's file for any information relating to Margaret's disappearance, worried that she could have been the victim of foul play or could have gotten into a car accident in an isolated area. It would be due to these suspicions that the search and rescue efforts were temporarily reduced over the course of about two weeks. It would not be until the 3rd of March that proof of Margaret having arrived in the park was found. According to the United States Forest Service, one of the Forest Service law enforcement officers had found Margaret's van on the side of Forest Service Road 1051 in the Cummins Ridge Trail area. The Cummins Ridge Road was a far deeper major pathway that was only accessible after driving south through an area known as Neptune State Scenic Viewpoint, past a coastal area named the Devil's Churn due to its history of supernatural sightings. Inexperienced hikers would not have been able to see that the small trail opens up into a much larger pathway, and so investigators were certain that Margaret must have visited the area several times in the past to know exactly how much room there would be for her vehicle. The vehicle itself was completely unoccupied, and after having been searched, a park receipt would be located that would confirm that Margaret Kohler had reached the park sometime on the 20th of February. Immediately after the vehicle was discovered by the United States Forest Service law enforcement officer, a massive search would be conducted in the area for a 10-mile radius. Unfortunately, despite more than 50 volunteers involved in the search, no sign of Margaret or her dog Roscoe was uncovered. On the following day, a team of bloodhounds were brought to the abandoned vehicle to help find a trackable scent. However, due to the tremendous gap in time from Margaret's initial disappearance and the discovery of her vehicle, the experienced canine teams were unable to locate a scent they could track. Oddly enough, on the 5th of March, more than two weeks since Margaret had disappeared, 
roughly 2.2 miles south of where Margaret's abandoned vehicle was located, local search and rescue volunteers would find Roscoe casually walking along the area of Ten Mile Creek. Once investigators took a closer look at Roscoe, they were surprised to find that the dog appeared to have been in perfect health. Deputies with the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office would make several attempts to get Roscoe to lead them to where Margaret may have been, but the dog seemed too playful and easily distracted, making it impossible for search and rescuers to get the dog to lead them back to Margaret. To this day, no sign of Margaret Kohler has even been uncovered. Oddly enough, across many of the bizarre missing 411 disappearances, it's commonly reported that during a sudden vanishing, hikers who travelled with a dog will often have their canines show up several days after their disappearance, but with no sign of the hiker ever being uncovered. Even more peculiar, the returning canines will often seem to be in perfect condition, regardless of the weather conditions or the number of days missing, as if no time had passed for them in the interim. The Disappearance of Keith Zunke On the 24th of October, back in 1981, a 21-year-old man by the name of Keith Zunke would be reported missing after a very bizarre set of suspicious circumstances had occurred, leading many of the investigators surrounding the incident wondering what really happened. Not only would the circumstance of Keith's disappearance be extraordinarily peculiar, the legal documents surrounding Keith's disappearance would also appear to be mishandled in various ways following his vanishing, leading to increasing difficulties for the young man's search. According to Keith's mother, when Keith was a young boy, he had suffered an undisclosed injury that would leave him crippled for the rest of his life and cause Keith to suffer from issues with typical neurodevelopment. Although the injury itself is not known in the modern day, by the time that he was a teenager, it became apparent to doctors that Keith would never be able to develop past a mental age of only five years old, suffering from an extensive amount of brain damage. Due to these developmental issues, Keith would eventually be forced to live in a group home by the time that he was an adult, located in Walla Walla, Washington, after his biological parents felt that they were unable to properly care for him. It would be shortly after his 21st birthday, while living in the Washington group home, that Keith would suddenly be at the centre of a bizarre missing persons case that would be impossible to explain under normal circumstances. According to the official search and rescue document, it was on the 24th of October, back in 1981, while living at the Stone Creek Lodge Group home located in Washington, that the group home administrators decided that taking a small trip together with all of the home's residents would be a nice change of pace for the residents. By that afternoon, all 39 residents would be driven to the Umatilla National Forest to go on a mountain hike through Oregon, east of the Cascade Range in the northeastern section of the state. The administrators of the home would later tell investigators that out of all of the residents, only two members objected to the trip and wished to stay at the group home instead. One of those two that would object would be Keith. Once at the Umatilla National Forest, Keith and another resident would both get into an argument with the administrators and refuse to continue with the hike any further, after walking a few hundred feet down a trail with the group. After the tantrum, the counsellors would become fed up with Keith and the other unnamed resident and would instruct them to return to the vehicle to wait in the car for the remainder of the trip due to their behaviour. However, at this point, the stories of the administrators and the residents begin to start cracking. According to some of the residents, Keith and the other unnamed resident had been accompanied with a group home administrator to return to the vehicle, though the other counsellors and administrators on the trip would deny the claim and state that Keith and the other unnamed resident had travelled back to the vehicle while unsupervised. Once the group had finished with their hike and returned to the vehicle, they found the unnamed resident in the vehicle alone and with Keith nowhere to be found. Immediately, the counsellors and administrators would question the unnamed resident, but were unable to get any reasonable information surrounding Keith's whereabouts, and so would soon contact the local law enforcement shortly after. Within the hour, the United States Forest Service and the local sheriff began a massive search for Keith, utilising an estimated 500 search and rescue volunteers for the event. These volunteers included members from the local military, nearby law enforcement, native residents and teams of air support flying overhead for several hours a day looking for Keith. Unfortunately, despite searching non-stop for an estimated 10 days and covering nearly 50 square miles of area, no sign of Keith was ever recovered, and the search and rescue for the 21-year-old man would soon come to a standstill. It was at around this point 
that investigators began to grow suspicious of the parties involved. Keith's biological mother, Mrs. Rebecca Carroll, would give information to the investigators claiming that Keith had the mental age of a five-year-old and would have been unable to have wandered very far from where he had last been seen. Given the fact that the other unnamed resident was also unable to provide any useful information, it appeared that the entire event held a few more skeletons in the closet. It would not be for another 30 years until news surrounding the case would come forward. According to the Huffington Post, the remains of Keith were discovered by a hiker during the summer of 2011, but what was left of Keith was so damaged and scattered, investigators were left with very little. Although the remains were easily identifiable as human, they appeared to have been partially buried in a shallow grave, forcing investigators to first confirm that the remains were not from a possible Native American burial site. After the remains were confirmed as not belonging to an old Native American burial ground, investigators removed the remains and sent them to a forensic anthropologist and Oregon State Medical Examiner. Unfortunately, very little could be done with what was left. According to the investigators, Keith was no longer classified as a missing person. This meant that any evidence surrounding his DNA was not kept, and so Keith's DNA was not on file to be compared with the discovered remains. Additionally, because of the state of the remains, the Oregon State Medical Examiner said that he was unable to confirm a cause for Keith's passing. No other information has surfaced surrounding the incident since the article was reported. The Mysterious Disappearance of Michael and Makana Gortler On the 22nd of June, back in 2011, a father and daughter would suddenly vanish when going on a hike to the summit of Mount Missouri, located in the state of Colorado. Although the two experienced hikers would reach the summit at around 14,000 feet, their remains would tell a completely different story when investigators would conduct a thorough investigation into the matter. According to the missing persons report, 53-year-old Michael von Gortler and his daughter, 20-year-old Makana von Gortler, would leave their home in Boulder, Colorado on the 14th of June to spend the summer going on a series of hiking and climbing trails together over the spend of about a week. Michael, who worked as an emergency room physician in the city of Boulder, Colorado, had often visited the nearby trails and mountain ranges over the years and had become quite an experienced outdoorsman, hiker and climber across the many Colorado mountain ranges. Additionally, Michael's daughter, Makana, who studied out of the University of Colorado, majoring in ecology and evolutionary biology, would often spend her entire spring, summer and winter vacations between school going on long hiking and camping trips with her father to get pictures of the natural wildlife and ecology of the local area. Makana would also be considered by many close friends and family as having been extremely experienced in both hiking and climbing, and both Makana and her father were in excellent physical shape at the time of their disappearance. It was later uncovered by investigators that Michael and Makana would spend the majority of their week-long camping and hiking trip at the father's second home. Michael's second home was a small summer house located in the town of Buena Vista, roughly 150 miles west of Boulder. It was also believed that Michael and Makana would spend that first week together traveling to the town of Telluride and attending the Bluegrass Festival before returning back home to the summer house in Buena Vista in order to make several preparations. It would be there that the two hikers would spend several days planning their trip to Mount Missouri, including acquiring several updated maps to help plan their routes, purchase and replace new equipment for their climbs, and stock up on extra emergency gear in the event of sudden bad weather conditions or any unforeseen issues. Although their precautions may have seemed too cautious, considering the fact that the two only had plans to camp around the base of Mount Missouri for a few days and then hike the summit of the mountain before returning back to the base of the mountain on a short day trip, Michael Gortler was known for being over-prepared when it came to hiking and camping journeys. Prior to their departure, Makana would send a text to her longtime boyfriend, a man by the name of Paul Casimir, that the two were headed up to a mountain trail with a summit measured at being 14,000 feet, but that her phone had been left on the roaming setting due to their cellular network connection being out of range, and that she would be unable to text or call as she wanted to avoid using data as her data plan was more expensive when it came to using roaming data. The text she had sent would later be confirmed with a local ABC News article, which would publish the text to the boyfriend. The text would read as follows. I just got back to Buena Vista with my dad. I left my phone on roaming so I can't talk. We had a great time and we're going to try a 14er tomorrow. 
I'll be able to see you in a few days. I've missed you too. The Fortiner would be a reference to the height of the mountain, with Makana's cryptic message, meaning that the two would be attempting to climb a summit estimated around 14,000 feet. The night before their disappearance, on the 22nd of June, at around 12.23 in the morning, Makana would send one last text to her boyfriend Paul, which would state the following. We're hiking Mount Missouri tomorrow, staying the night here then driving back the 23rd. I will help my dad pack the next day, so I can see you on the 25th, and we can celebrate whatever month we're in now. After a few days passed, Paul would fail to get any reply or message back from either Michael or Makana, and would begin to worry that something strange had happened. By the 24th, Paul would grow increasingly disturbed by the lack of reply that he would reach out to Makana's mother, Michael's wife, Mrs. Dea von Gortler, and ask her when the two were expected to return back to Boulder and why the two were not returning his texts or phone calls. At first, Dea would reassure Paul that the two were most likely taking their time coming back from the trip and would return sometime on the 24th of June or the 25th, but that she would reach out to Michael and Makana to check up on them. After spending a few hours trying to reach her husband and daughter and failing to get in contact with them, Mrs. Dea von Gortler would contact the Chaffee County Sheriff's Department to report the two as missing and to do a checkup on their whereabouts. At first, the search for Michael and Makana went slowly as investigators first wanted to confirm that the two were still in the area of Mount Missouri and not back at their Buena Vista summer home. After driving an estimated three hours to the summer house, Mrs. Dea von Gortler would confirm that her husband and daughter were missing, and after several hours of searching, the Chaffee County Sheriff's Department would locate and find Michael von Gortler's vehicle parked at the Mount Missouri parking lot located at the base of the mountain. Almost immediately upon finding the vehicle, the Sheriff's Department would organize one of the largest ground and aerial searches conducted in the state, alongside the local military and other law enforcement organizations. On the first day of the search, the nearby military base would utilize a state-of-the-art Black Hawk helicopter to help carry search and rescue volunteers near the summit of the three surrounding 14,000-foot mountains. While ferrying people, the military would also utilize thermal imaging cameras and other sensitive equipment in the hopes of locating the missing two hikers within the first few days. Over 40 search and rescue volunteers would be brought to the summits of the mountains, an estimated 12 volunteers per peak, and would help to cover over a thousand feet in elevation that first day, but no sign of the missing hikers were found. Investigators were worried that their search efforts may have been in vain as the area of the mountains and their summits were completely barren and held very little foliage, making it difficult to explain how it was that aerial support was unable to spot the brightly clothed pair from the sky anywhere along the route. Even more strange, an article published in the local news would also claim that by the eighth day of the search for the missing father and daughter, it was believed that search and rescue volunteers, the Sheriff's Department, United States National Forest Rangers and the nearby military base had covered more than 800 square miles of terrain, both by ground and air, and were unable to find any sign of the missing pair. It would not be until the tenth day of the search that investigators would finally recover the missing father and daughter when the search helicopter was in the middle of depositing another group of search and rescue volunteers on the summit of Mount Missouri. According to the helicopter pilot, as he was descending onto the summit, the pilot claimed that he saw something incredibly unusual in the forest area directly below their passing location. Although the pilot would never describe what he saw that was considered distinctly unusual, rumors from search and rescue volunteers claimed that he saw what looked like a large figure in the area that seemed difficult to explain. Unsure of what it was that was seen, the pilot would send the volunteers into the area where they would find two individuals. According to the volunteers, the hikers were not immediately identified as belonging to Michael and Makana, as they were injured and disfigured beyond recognition. Though the pair would later be confirmed as having been the missing father and daughter, there was initially no declaration of their identities and several other bizarre events would take place that would make missing 411 investigators suspicious as to the nature of the recovery. A group of search and rescue volunteers would claim that the couple were found in a forested area far from any ledges or cliffs, somewhere around the 12,000-foot elevation mark on the mountain. Another group would claim that they were found lying atop an open field of grass around the similar elevation mark. However, despite these conflicting stories, 
no confirmation of either account would be made, leading many missing 411 investigators with the suspicions that a bizarre cover-up had taken place. It would take another few days before the coroner could confirm the identity of the injured pair as belonging to Michael and Makana. However, even more peculiar, the coroner and sheriff's department worked together in order to provide an explanation of what happened to Michael and Makana, as both the coroner and sheriff's department were confused as to the exact location where they were found and the exact nature of their demise. The Chaffee County Sheriff's Department would hold a press conference on the 5th of July, claiming that the discovery of where Michael and Makana were found came as a total shock to the investigators. It was hard to understand how any accident could have occurred as the von Gortlers had been at a high elevation and appeared to have been suffering from injuries inconsistent with a fall. Additionally, the Sheriff's Department would confirm that the weather had been exceptionally good at the time of their expected demise, as there was no measured wind, no clouds, and no sudden weather shifts that could have led to any accidents for the pair. In all considerations, the day of their disappearance was a perfect day for a short hike to the summit and back down. The most confusing statements would come from several interviewed searchers on a live broadcast from the NBC 9 Denver news station, which would claim that it was believed that the pair had to have reached the summit and fallen while they were descending the summit along a hiking trail. The searchers would claim that less than 200 feet from the summit, the pair fell. However, the Chaffee County Sheriff Pete Palmer would tell reporters that it was difficult to confirm the theory as the distance and placement of the hikers was both too far and in too awkward of a location for the pair to have fallen from only 200 feet from the summit. The sheriff would also provide the statement to the news reporters claiming that they were not sure where they were when they fell, as none of the information they had seemed to match up. In one report, searchers would claim they believed that the pair had fallen 200 feet from the summit while descending. Another report would claim that the bodies of the father and daughter were found in a densely forested area at the 12,000-foot elevation point. And a third report would claim that the pair were found much closer to the summit, laid out on grass. Even more peculiar, the coroner's office would claim that the damage and injuries of the pair were consistent only with a fall estimated to have been at least 1,000 feet in height at a 60-degree grade, which would have been impossible to have suffered from if only a few hundred feet from the summit or at the 12,000-foot elevation point. Chaffee County Coroner Randy Ametis would also make several increasingly bizarre statements to reporters, claiming that the only thing known for certain was that Dr. Michael von Gortler and his daughter, Makana von Gortler, had both passed away from blunt force trauma injuries to the head and neck at almost the exact same time. At first, the coroner believed there was evidence of burn or scorch marks, but would later confirm that there was no indication of injuries caused from lightning, a strange statement that seemed both unwarranted and inconsistent. Randy Ametis would also confirm that due to the condition of the pair, it was believed that the two had passed away on the 22nd of June, the same day that the hike had initially begun. Despite the inconsistent information and data, the coroner's office would confirm that the passings were officially declared as accidents, and it was believed that no crime had been committed. The coroners would provide relatives of the von Gertler with the explanation that the two had most likely been blown off the cliff from a significant gust of wind, despite reports of clear skies and low winds. However, one of the most difficult to explain aspects of the coroner's report with a lack of injuries to other parts of the hikers. According to the searchers, Michael and Makana had to have fallen at least a thousand feet to explain their injuries and location. At the height and steep grade, injuries would be expected to be seen across them, including small and large scrapes, bruises, torn clothes, and small and large rocks around their remains. However, the coroner's statements only included claims and descriptions that Michael and Makana had died from blunt force trauma to their head and neck, without making any other statements about injuries to the torso, legs, or other regions of the body. Given the fact that Michael and Makana, who were experienced hikers and climbers, were believed to have been on an easy trail at the time of their fall, Chaffee County Sheriff's Officer Pete Palmer would express disbelief at the mystery of their passings. A local article would publish a statement provided by the sheriff's officer and their skepticism in the middle of July stating the following, It hasn't been any kind of atrocious weather, and the other thing is both these people were experienced hikers, Chaffee County Sheriff Pete Palmer said. Palmer says that what happened is a complete mystery. While steep, 
the Missouri Mountain Trail is only ranked as a Type 2 climb, which is fairly mild. Authorities say it didn't appear the two had taken a fall. The search and rescue volunteers would also express confusion surrounding the location that the hikers were recovered. It seemed impossible to explain how the hikers were not found until the tenth day of the search in an area so close to the summit and believed to have been checked several times over by volunteers during the first week of the operation. Helicopters had also been flying in and around the area every single day since the disappearance and not a single person had seen the pair in a location that the two were expected to have been hiking in. To this day, the mysterious passings of Michael and Makana von Gortler have been the subject of many theories and continue to be regarded as one of the most mysterious and unexplainable accidents recorded in the Colorado mountains. Humans have an innate curiosity to understand and solve puzzles. Unsolved mysteries offer a tantalizing challenge, and people are often drawn to them in an effort to solve the mystery and satisfy their curiosity. People are often fascinated by the unknown and unexplained. Unsolved mysteries represent a glimpse into a world of uncertainty and intrigue. The Mystery of the Nemi Ships The Nemi ships were two ancient Roman ships that were discovered in Lake Nemi, near Rome, in the early 20th century. The larger of the two ships was over 70 meters long and was considered one of the largest ancient ships ever built. The Nemi ships were built by the Roman Emperor Caligula in the 1st century AD as floating palaces for his personal use. They were incredibly luxurious and had features such as heated baths, mosaic floors and marble columns. The Nemi ships had heating systems. They were built with hypercosts, which were a type of underfloor heating system used in ancient Roman times. The hypercosts consisted of a series of channels and flues beneath the floors of the ships, which allowed hot air to circulate and warm the rooms. In addition to the hypercosts, the Nemi ships also had other heating features, such as furnaces and boilers, which were used to heat water for the baths and to provide heat for other areas of the ships. The heating systems of the Nemi ships were an impressive feat of engineering for their time, and they demonstrate the advanced technological capabilities of the ancient Romans. After Caligula's passing, the Nemi ships were scuttled in the lake and remained underwater for almost 2,000 years until they were discovered in the 1920s. The Italian government raised the ships from the lake in the 1930s and put them on display in a museum built specifically for them. Unfortunately, both of the Nemi ships were destroyed during World War II, and today only a few fragments remain. However, the story of the Nemi ships has captured the imagination of historians and the public alike, and they remain a fascinating example of ancient Roman engineering and extravagance. The Nemi ships are an example of brilliant engineering for their time. The ancient Romans were skilled shipbuilders and engineers, and the Nemi ships were a testament to their expertise. The Nemi ships were some of the largest and most elaborate ships of their time, and they were built with a high degree of craftsmanship and attention to detail. They were also designed to be functional, with features like the hypercost heating systems and other amenities that made them comfortable and livable for their occupants. The fact that the Nemi ships were scuttled and sunk in Lake Nemi and yet remained preserved for almost 2,000 years is a testament to their durability and the quality of their construction. The mystery here is that the ship's discovery proved that the ancient Romans were capable of building large ships. Historians, scholars and researchers often ridiculed the idea that the Romans were capable of building such a large ship, but due to the Nemi ship's discovery, it's caused historians to admit that they were wrong about Roman technology and said that it caused them to question what they were capable of. The Mystery of Greek Fire Greek fire was a weapon used by the Byzantine Empire in the medieval period, primarily during the 7th to 12th centuries. It was a highly effective incendiary weapon that could be used to set enemy ships on fire and cause chaos and destruction on the battlefield. The exact composition of Greek fire is not known with certainty, as the recipe was a closely guarded secret. However, it is believed to have been a type of liquid fire that could stick to surfaces and continue to burn even when exposed to water. Greek fire was typically deployed using a flamethrower-like device called a siphon, which allowed the user to direct a stream of the liquid fire towards their target. It was also sometimes launched in pots or jars, which would break upon impact and release the fire. One of the reasons that Greek fire was so effective was that it was difficult to extinguish. 
water could actually make it burn more intensely, and attempts to smother it with sand or other materials were often unsuccessful. The use of Greek fire helped the Byzantine Empire to fend off numerous attacks by enemy forces, including the Arab and Viking fleets. However, over time the technology and techniques for creating and deploying the weapon were lost, and by the 14th century it was no longer used in warfare. The exact composition of Greek fire is not known as no written records of the formula have survived. However, historians have been able to identify some general characteristics of the weapon based on historical accounts and contemporary descriptions. Historians have detailed some of the general characteristics of Greek fire. It was a liquid fire that could be sprayed or thrown at targets. It was highly flammable and burned fiercely, even when exposed to water. It was difficult to extinguish and could continue to burn on water. It could be directed at a specific target using a siphon or similar device. It was sticky and could adhere to surfaces, making it difficult to remove. It was effective against both people and ships. It could cause panic and confusion among enemy troops, helping to break their morale. Although Greek fire is a mystery, historians and researchers have said that Greek fire was a highly effective and feared weapon that helped the Byzantine Empire to defend against numerous attacks. Its exact composition may never be known for certain, but its general characteristics make it clear why it was so effective on the battlefield. What's underneath the Great Sphinx? The question of what is under the Great Sphinx in Egypt is a topic of much debate and speculation among archaeologists and historians. The most widely accepted theory is that there are tunnels and chambers beneath the Sphinx, but their purpose and contents remain unknown. Some archaeologists and Egyptologists believe that the tunnels and chambers may have been part of the complex system of tombs and temples that surround the Sphinx and the nearby pyramids. Others speculate that the chambers may have been used for religious or ritual purposes. In recent years, there have been claims that there may be a secret chamber or even an entire underground city beneath the Sphinx, but there is no scientific evidence to support these claims. It's important to note that any excavation or exploration of the area around the Sphinx would be subject to strict regulations and permits, and any discoveries would need to be carefully evaluated and documented by archaeologists and other experts. With that being said, technology has revealed that there is evidence of tunnels and shafts beneath the Great Sphinx at Giza, but their purpose and extent are still a matter of debate. During various excavations and surveys of the Sphinx and its surrounding area, researchers have identified a number of tunnels and shafts that appear to be of ancient origin. The purpose of these tunnels and shafts is not entirely clear, but they are believed to have been part of the complex system of tombs and temples that were built during the Old Kingdom period in Egypt. Some researchers have speculated that the tunnels and shafts may have been used for religious or ritual purposes or as a means of accessing the underground water table. One idea is that of the Hall of Records. The concept of a Hall of Records hidden beneath the Great Sphinx is a popular but unfounded claim that has been put forward by a number of researchers who've studied ancient Egypt. The idea of a Hall of Records beneath the Sphinx can be traced back to a series of 19th century articles and books by French author Edgar Cayce. According to Cayce, the Hall of Records was a vast library of ancient knowledge and wisdom, containing information about the lost civilization of Atlantis, as well as other lost civilizations and technologies. As of right now, mainstream scientists have said that there is no archaeological evidence to support the existence of such a hall, and the theory has been dismissed by mainstream scholars. Moreover, the idea of a vast underground library being hidden beneath the Sphinx raises many practical questions, such as how such a structure could be constructed and maintained without leaving any trace or evidence. The Mysterious Wangina Cave Paintings The Wangina Cave Paintings are a collection of ancient rock art located in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. These paintings are believed to have been created by the indigenous people of the region, known as the Wangina or Wangina people, who have lived in the area for tens of thousands of years. The Wangina Cave Paintings are known for their distinctive style and their depictions of humanoid figures with large round eyes and no mouths. These figures are believed to represent the Wanjina spirits, who are considered to be the creators of the land and the guardians of the people. The paintings are typically made using red and white ochre and are found in a variety of locations, including caves, rock shelters and overhangs. 
Many of the paintings are located in remote and difficult to reach areas and are considered to be of great cultural and spiritual significance to the indigenous people of the region. The one Gina cave paintings are thought to be among the oldest examples of rock art in the world, with some estimates suggesting that they may be as much as 40,000 years old. They are an important part of the cultural heritage of the Wangina people and are also recognized as an important archaeological and artistic resource by the wider world. Due to the depictions of humanoids, it's caused some to suggest that the figures are actually extraterrestrials, further noting that these interpretations can be seen in various cave paintings across the world and suggest that perhaps ancient humans came into contact with something otherworldly. However, Historians have said that the Wangina cave paintings do not depict aliens and say that the figures depicted in the paintings are believed to represent the Wangina spirits, which are an important part of the indigenous religious and cultural traditions of the Kimberley region of Western Australia. The Sea Serpent Spotted by the Crew of HMS Daedalus The sighting of the HMS Daedalus Sea Serpent occurred on August 6, 1848, when crew members of the British Royal Navy ship HMS Daedalus reported seeing an enormous sea serpent in the waters of the Mid-Atlantic Ocean. According to the accounts, the creature was said to be around 60 feet long, with a head resembling that of a snake or a lizard, and a neck that rose approximately 6 feet out of the water. The creature's body was described as being thick and covered in scales, with a coloration that alternated between light brown and black. It was also said to have humps on its back, that moved up and down in a wave-like motion. The sighting reportedly lasted for around 20 minutes and was witnessed by several crew members, including the ship's captain, Peter McQuay. The creature was said to be moving at a speed of around 15 miles per hour and appeared to be heading east. The incident gained widespread media attention and sparked a great deal of debate and speculation about the existence of sea monsters. Some skeptics dismissed the sighting as a misidentification of a known creature such as a giant squid or a whale, while others believed it to be proof of the existence of previously unknown species. Oddly enough, this creature was sighted and described by those who spent the majority of their life at sea, and so researchers into the unknown have said that they would easily be able to identify sea creatures local to the region, saying that this adds weight to the theory that the crew encountered a mysterious unknown creature. In the years since the sighting, there has been much speculation and analysis of the accounts, with some suggesting that the creature may have been a hoax perpetrated by the crew, or that it was a misidentification of a known animal. However, the sighting remains one of the most well-known and intriguing sea monster reports in history. The Mystery of Sri Lanka's Stargate The Sri Lanka Stargate, also known as the Kotuwe Card Stargate, is a mysterious artifact located in Sri Lanka that has long fascinated scholars and enthusiasts of the paranormal. The artifact is a circular stone disc, measuring approximately three feet in diameter, with intricate carvings of cosmic and geometric patterns. The origins of the Sri Lanka Stargate are shrouded in mystery, with some theories suggesting that it was created by an ancient civilization with advanced knowledge of astronomy and cosmology. The carvings on the disc are said to depict a variety of celestial objects, including stars, planets, and galaxies, as well as symbols and diagrams related to ancient religious and spiritual traditions. One of the most intriguing aspects of the Sri Lanka Stargate is its alleged ability to act as a portal or gateway to other dimensions or realities. According to some accounts, the disc was used in ancient times by priests or shamans as a means of accessing other realms of consciousness or communicating with beings from other worlds. While the claims of the Sri Lanka Stargate's supernatural abilities remain unproven, the artifact continues to fascinate researchers and enthusiasts of the paranormal. Some have even speculated that the disc may have extraterrestrial origins or that it may hold the key to unlocking the secrets of advanced ancient civilizations. Despite the intrigue and speculation surrounding the Sri Lanka Stargate, the artifact remains a subject of debate and controversy within the scientific and archaeological communities. While some believe that the disc may hold important clues to unlocking the mysteries of the universe, others are skeptical of its alleged powers and origins. Despite the uncertainties surrounding the Sri Lanka Stargate, its mysterious carvings and intriguing history continue to capture the imagination of those who seek to understand the secrets of the universe and the mysteries of the past. 
Whether or not the artifact holds the key to unlocking these secrets remains to be seen, but its continued study and investigation will undoubtedly inspire new discoveries and insights for years to come. The Mystery of the Lost City of Paititi The city of Paititi, also known as El Dorado, is a legendary lost city that is said to be located somewhere in the jungles of South America, possibly in the Andes Mountains. It is believed to be a vast, wealthy metropolis that was hidden away by the Inca civilization to keep it safe from Spanish conquistadors during the 16th century. According to the legend, the city is made entirely of gold and other precious metals and contains vast treasures beyond imagination, including artifacts, gems, and precious stones. It's also said to be home to a powerful ruler who possesses great wisdom and knowledge and who is protected by a fierce army of warriors. The story of the lost city has captured the imaginations of explorers, adventurers and treasure hunters for centuries, and many expeditions have been launched in search of the lost city. However, despite extensive searches and investigations, no concrete evidence of the city's existence has ever been found. The legend is believed to have originated from the traditions of indigenous peoples in South America and has been passed down through generations. Some historians and archaeologists believe that the story may have been inspired by real-life events, such as the flight of the Inca emperor Atahualpa during the Spanish conquest of Peru, when he is said to have hidden vast amounts of treasure in the Andes Mountains. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, the legend of Paititi continues to inspire speculation and fascination, and the search for the lost city remains a popular topic among adventurers and explorers. The location of the city of El Dorado is uncertain and has been the subject of much speculation over the years. According to legend, the city is believed to be located somewhere in the jungles of South America, possibly in the Andes Mountains, but the exact location has been a mystery for centuries, with many explorers and adventurers launching expeditions to try to find the lost city. Interestingly, some have suggested that the lost city is in the Amazon rainforest. As of today, researchers and explorers are constantly making interesting discoveries in the Amazon rainforest, with one of the most recent finds being that of ancient pyramids and roadways. Archaeologists have said that there are ancient archaeological sites and ruins scattered throughout the Amazon region, including impressive examples of pre-Columbian engineering, such as causeways, mounds and terraced hillsides. The Amazon rainforest is a vast and largely unexplored region, and there is always the possibility that new archaeological discoveries could be made in the future. Despite many claims and rumors of sightings, no concrete evidence of the lost city's existence has ever been found, leading some to believe that it may be purely a mythical place. However, the legend of Paititi continues to inspire speculation and fascination among many, and the search for the lost city remains a popular topic among adventurers and explorers. The Lost Dutchman's Gold Mine The Lost Dutchman's Gold Mine is a legendary mine said to be located somewhere in the Superstition Mountains of Arizona, USA. According to the legend, the mine contains a vast fortune in gold and other precious metals, and has been sought after by treasure hunters and adventurers for over a century. The story of the Lost Dutchman's Gold Mine dates back to the mid-19th century, when a German immigrant named Jacob Waltz, also known as the Dutchman, claimed to have discovered the mine while prospecting in the Superstition Mountains. According to Waltz, he had stumbled upon a vein of gold so rich that he was able to collect large quantities of ore simply by scraping the surface of the rock with a knife. Over the years, the story of Waltz's discovery grew into a legend, and many treasure hunters and adventurers attempted to locate the lost mine. However, despite extensive searches, the mine was never found and Waltz himself passed away without revealing its location. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, the legend of the lost Dutchman's gold mine continued to inspire fascination and speculation, and many theories and stories emerged about the mine's location and the fate of those who sought it. Some claimed that the mine was guarded by supernatural forces, while others suggested that Waltz had taken the secret of its location to his grave. In the decades that followed, Countless expeditions were launched in search of the lost mine, and many stories emerged of treasure hunters who had supposedly discovered it, only to meet with misfortune or disappear under mysterious circumstances. However, despite the persistent search, the lost Dutchman's gold mine has never been definitively located. Today, the legend of the lost Dutchman's gold mine remains a popular topic among treasure hunters, adventurers, 
and folklore enthusiasts. While some believe that the mine is purely a myth, others continue to search for its elusive location, hoping to uncover the vast fortune that is said to lie hidden in the Superstition Mountains. The Mysterious Treasure of Lima The Treasure of Lima is a legendary treasure said to have been hidden by Spanish forces during the War of Independence in Peru in the early 19th century. According to the legend, the treasure consists of a vast collection of gold, silver, jewels, and other precious objects, valued at hundreds of millions of dollars. The story of the treasure of Lima dates back to 1820, when Spanish forces were fighting against the forces of Peruvian independence. As the Spanish forces retreated, they are said to have gathered up a vast treasure of gold and silver objects from the churches, convents and palaces of Lima, the capital city of Peru at the time. The treasure was reportedly loaded onto a convoy of mules and wagons and transported out of the city under cover of darkness. The convoy made its way across the Andes Mountains to the coast, where the treasure was reportedly hidden in a cave or a remote location. Over the years, the legend of the treasure of Lima has inspired countless treasure hunters and adventurers to search for the lost treasure. Many stories have emerged of treasure hunters who claim to have discovered the location of the treasure, only to be thwarted by deadly traps or treacherous terrain. Despite the persistent search, the location of the treasure of Lima has never been definitively discovered, and the treasure remains one of the most elusive and sought-after treasures in the world. In recent years, however, new evidence has emerged that suggests that the treasure may be located in a complex system of underground tunnels and chambers beneath the city of Lima. The tunnels were reportedly constructed by Spanish forces during the colonial period, and were later used as a hideout by rebel forces during the War of Independence. While the location of the treasure of Lima remains a mystery, the legend of the treasure continues to inspire fascination and speculation among treasure hunters and adventurers around the world. Whether or not the treasure will ever be found remains to be seen, but the search for the elusive treasure is sure to continue for many years to come. The Treasure of the Esperanza The Treasure of the Esperanza is a legendary treasure said to have been hidden by Spanish forces during the Mexican-American War in the mid-19th century. According to the legend, the treasure consists of a vast collection of gold, silver, jewels, and other precious objects, valued at millions of dollars. The story of the treasure of the Esperanza dates back to 1846, when the Mexican-American conflict broke out between the United States and Mexico. As the war raged on, a Spanish galleon named the Esperanza was reportedly sailing off the coast of Mexico, carrying a valuable cargo of gold, silver, and other treasures. In order to avoid capture by the American forces, the crew of the Esperanza reportedly buried the treasure on a remote island off the coast of Mexico. The location of the island and the treasure's hiding place were reportedly marked by a set of cryptic clues and symbols known only to the crew of the galleon. Over the years, the legend of the treasure of the Esperanza has inspired countless treasure hunters and adventurers to search for the lost treasure. Many stories have emerged of treasure hunters who claim to have discovered the location of the treasure only to be thwarted by deadly traps or treacherous terrain. Despite the persistent search, the location of the treasure of the Esperanza has never been definitively discovered and the treasure remains one of the most elusive and sought-after treasures in the world. In recent years, however, new evidence has emerged that suggests that the treasure may be located on the coast of Mexico, near the site where the Esperanza was last seen. Some treasure hunters believe that the clues to the treasure's location are hidden in ancient maps and documents, while others believe that advanced technology, such as ground-penetrating radar, may be used to locate the treasure. While the location of the treasure of the Esperanza remains a mystery, the legend of the treasure continues to inspire fascination and speculation among treasure hunters and adventurers around the world. Whether or not the treasure will ever be found remains to be seen, but the search for the elusive treasure is sure to continue for many years to come. Who were the mysterious sea people? Though there were many ancient civilizations that had existed during the 12th century BC, suddenly and quite unexpectedly, nearly every civilization was wiped from the face of the earth except for the cities of Egypt. This phenomenon was recorded as the Late Bronze Age Collapse, and it's said that only small villages survived this sudden catastrophe. For many decades, 
The cause of such an occurrence had widely been unknown and shrouded in mystery. That was until the ancient language of the Egyptian hieroglyphics had been decoded and allowed us to read the historical records captured at the time by the last standing ancient civilization. This record has led to countless theories and endless debate amongst Egyptologists, classic historians and archaeologists since its findings. Over 2,000 years before the Vikings sailed from today's Scandinavia to plague the Europeans, the ancient world empires faced a terrifying sea-traveling enemy of their own, and that has remained a mystery up to today. During the Bronze Age, the sea people caused terror in the Mediterranean and Egyptian lands, but their origin and identity has remained a mystery until this day. An inscription written in the 13th century BC said that they came from the sea in their ships and that nobody could defeat them. Reportedly, by the historical accounts of the ancient Egyptians, armies of what had been referred to at the time as Sea People attacked and demolished the cities of man. In fact, the descriptions of the armies of the Sea People describe monsters and giants coming from the oceans and waging war against all of civilization. The reasoning for why this sudden onslaught had occurred has yet to be understood, but what's surprising is the vast amount of theories surrounding the events. Accounts continue of the Egyptians attempting to track the source of the beasts that appeared humanoid in nature, and it's reported that they found hundreds of footprints coming from the beaches of the Mediterranean Sea. Today, after uncovering vast art depicting the battles, documents detailing the events, and further evidence of war and tactics used against the destroyed and forgotten civilizations of the past, the proof of the account of the Sea People appears to be overwhelming in nature. As a matter of fact, the events are so overwhelming that the discussion surrounding the event in the scientific community has been somewhat confusing, and further theories or attempts at uncovering the truth are treated with ridicule. The Egyptian inscriptions provide almost all there is to know about the Sea People, apart from the references in the letters from Assyrians and Hittites that have contributed to the subject. They were also mentioned in the Egyptian literature, the tale of Wenemum, where they appear as familiar figures in the Mediterranean land. Who were the Sea People that invaded ancient Egypt? Everything known about the Sea People comes from apocalyptic inscriptions that were made by the empires they battled, especially ancient Egyptians, since they did not leave any written records or monuments of their own. One early reference goes back to the 1300 BC during the ruling of Pharaoh Merempta, as he claimed of taking out over 6,000 seafarers after they allied with the Libyans. An even more detailed account from Ramses III who fought with the Sea People back in 1170 described them as having moved southwestern towns in Turkey, Levant and Cyprus, desolating its residents and leaving the city as if it had never existed. The Ekwesh have been related to the Ahiyawa in the records of Hitti, who may be Achaean Greeks who colonized the western Anatolian coast and the Aegean Islands. They consisted of sea raiders who invaded the towns at the Mediterranean coast between 1276 and 1178 BC, focusing mostly on Egypt. History considers them as the major contributors to the collapse of the Bronze Age between 1250 and 1150 BC. Where did the Sea People come from? Scholars are still not certain of the origins of these groups, but many trace them to Sicily, Turkey's Anatolia region, or the Aegean Sea. Some modern historians have a theory that the ancient Egyptians knew the origins of the Sea People based on what they wrote about them. Due to the fact that these Egyptian inscriptions did not mention the origins of the groups, some historians believe that their origin was so obvious that it did not need to be written down. There are some speculations, with little evidence that the Sea People were in fact the Philistines of the Bible, who probably battled with ancient Israel, but who they are is still a mystery. Their origin has also been proposed and strongly disputed to be Trojan. From Italy, Philistine or Minoa, however, nothing has been discovered so far to shed more light on the question of their origin. Whether all this is true or not, the fact remains that the Sea People's origins are not written in any records and that information is therefore lost to history. What did they want? Equally mysterious is the motivation of the Sea People to ravage the Mediterranean. Some historians believe that they were displaced from their original home by natural disaster or famine. Other researchers state that the Sea People were Trojans displaced after they lost their kingdom to the Reeks in the Trojan battle. Whether the Trojan War story is true or is just a mythical story is unknown. 
The Sea People attacked many cities and Mediterranean settlements, but seemingly had an affinity for Egypt, attacking three different pharaohs. Their intentions for an attack, however, despite much research, remains a mystery to this day. What happened once they took over Egypt? Even though their origin remains unknown, tantalizing pieces of information about the damage that the Sea People inflicted on the ancient worlds are available thanks to the inscriptions the witnesses of the devastation left. Most of the current studies of the Sea People come from the inscriptions left behind from Rameses III's reign. Emmanuel de Rouge, a French Egyptologist, came up with the term Sea People in 1855 because reports claimed that they originated from the sea or islands but did not specify the particular ones. There were three pharaohs who recorded their interaction with these raiders, Rameses II, Merempta, who was his son and successor, and Rameses III. All three pharaohs were victorious over their enemies, and their inscriptions provided more detail about the existence of the Sea People. Ramses II and his inscriptions Ramses II was one of the greatest rulers of ancient Egyptian history, with accomplishments including securing his borders from invasion by nomads and also securing trade routes that were vital to their economy. In his inscriptions, he mentions the Sea People as allies of the Hittites and mercenaries in his own army. He does not mention anything about their identity or where they came from. Ramses inscribed his victory over the Sea People in a war off the Egyptian coast. According to what he inscribed, the battle involved only the Sherdan tribe of the Sea People and after the war. Many were recruited into Ramses's army. In his inscriptions, Ramses made the impression that he neutralized the threat. However, his successor's inscriptions claimed otherwise. The Inscription of Merempta the Sea People troubled Merempta's reign, especially after they allied with the Libyans in the Nile Delta invasion. From his inscriptions in his fifth year, the Libyan chief allied with the Sea People invading Egypt. Merempta describes the Sea People in his inscriptions as formidable adversaries and took pride in defeating them. He claimed complete victory over the Sea People, securing the Egyptian borders. He celebrated his victory by immortalizing its inscription in the Merempta Stele announcing how he brought peace to his land by subduing the enemy. Where did they go afterward? Ramses III knew of the clashes of the Sea People with his predecessors and opted for guerrilla tactics instead of field engagements with his predecessors. He organized ambushes along the coast and down the Nile Delta, hiding his archers along the shore so that they could rain arrows on the ships when he gave the signal. After confirming that no crew on the ship were alive, they set the downing vessels on fire with flaming arrows. After crushing the sea attacks, Ramses III focused on what was left of the Sea People on land. He used the same tactics and finally defeated the Sea People in 1170 right BC. After being defeated by Ramses III, the Sea People disappeared from history. However, according to San Jose State University, the Egyptians allowed the remaining Sea People to settle in today's Israel and Palestine. Despite the win over the Sea People, the battle drained the Egyptian royal treasury, rendering it unable to pay its tomb builders. This resulted in the first recorded labor strike in history, where the workers refused to work until they were fully paid. The Mysterious Sea Serpent Encounter of Hans Egede Hans Egede was a Norwegian-Danish Lutheran missionary who founded the settlement of Nuuk in Greenland in the early 18th century. In 1734, he reported seeing a sea serpent in the waters near Greenland, which he described in detail. According to Egidi's account, the sea serpent was approximately 60 feet long, with a head the size of a horse's head and a long, slender neck. He noted that the creature moved quickly through the water, with its head and neck often visible above the surface. Egidi also described the serpent's skin as being covered in rough, hard scales, with a color that was a mixture of gray and black. He noted that the serpent had two large, round eyes that were yellow in color and that it had a large mouth filled with sharp teeth. Egidi's account of the sea serpent was met with some skepticism at the time, and many people believed that he had simply seen a large fish or some other aquatic creature. However, the report of the sea serpent caught the attention of naturalists and other scientists, and it helped to spark a renewed interest in the study of marine biology and oceanography. In the years since Ejedi's sighting, there have been numerous other reports of sea serpents and other mysterious creatures in the world's oceans. 
The Mysterious Disappearance of David Guerrero David Guerrero was a 21-year-old student who disappeared in the early hours of March 8, 2005, in downtown Austin, Texas. His disappearance has remained a mystery for over a decade, with no solid leads or conclusive evidence of what happened to him. On the night of March 7, 2005, David and his friends were celebrating spring break and had visited several bars in the downtown area. They eventually ended up at a popular nightclub located on East 6th Street. David was last seen leaving the club at around 2 in the morning. He was reportedly walking towards his car, which was parked several blocks away. David never made it home that night, and his family and friends immediately became concerned when they were unable to reach him. They reported him missing to the Austin Police Department on March 9, 2005. Over the years, there have been several leads and possible sightings of David, but none of them have led to any conclusive evidence of his whereabouts. In 2006, a private investigator hired by David's family received a tip that he had been spotted in Mexico, but this lead ultimately turned out to be a dead end. In 2011, the case received renewed attention when a witness came forward claiming to have seen David in a homeless camp in downtown Austin shortly after his disappearance. The witness described a man matching David's description and claimed to have spoken to him briefly. However, despite an extensive search of the area, no further evidence was found. The circumstances surrounding David's disappearance are still a mystery, and his case remains unsolved. His family and friends continue to hold out hope that he will one day be found, and the Austin Police Department has stated that they will continue to investigate any new leads or information that comes to light. A full moon may affect human behavior. There has been a long-standing belief that the full moon can cause behavior changes in humans, including increased aggression, with some reports saying that people reported that they couldn't control themselves. Several studies have examined the relationship between the full moon and behavior changes, but although the results have been interesting, they have been somewhat inconsistent. Some studies have found a correlation between the full moon and increased hospital admissions for psychiatric emergencies, while others have found no such relationship. One possible explanation for the belief in full moon behavior changes is the psychological phenomenon of confirmation bias. This is the tendency to notice and remember information that confirms our pre-existing beliefs or expectations while disregarding information that contradicts them. In other words, people may be more likely to notice instances of aggressive behavior during a full moon and attribute them to the lunar cycle while overlooking similar behavior at other times. Another possible explanation is the placebo effect, in which people experience a change in behavior simply because they expect to. If someone believes that the full moon will cause them to become more unstable, they may act in ways that confirm this belief, even if there is no direct causal relationship between the moon and their behavior. So, what do you make of these unsolved mysteries? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comment section below and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.